That's Drew. And that's Mike. And that's Downey Live. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. You you can call me Mike. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you. For our listeners, Mike Downey is the host of Downey Live, the behind the scenes YouTube channel that brings you along for adventures like bobsledding, cranberry harvesting, train travel, and even getting some wild encounters with polar bears. Since starting in 2016, Mike's channel has grown to a community of 177,000 subscribers and over 15 million views. Check out his channel for more, including new videos every Saturday, and check out his custom hat by Worth Hats for a cap with a cool cause. Once again, thanks so much for your time today, Mike. Wow, that was a great intro. Love that. I might have to steal that off you. That was good. It, it would to, be my pleasure. <laughs> you, you it's all yours. The head. I can't take any credit. Thanks. Drew writes all the intros, so um, it's all him. He's a great writer. I, I, no, the job. Not true. I appreciate I've, I've written two and they were never as good as what Drew did. So I was like, Drew, that's <laughs> all you. So, hey man, so I appreciate it. must be you. hard to look at someone's channel. Like you said, 15 million views. I probably have 250 videos, you know, to look through that and go, okay, who is this guy? What's his channel about? And hone it down. And mine is pretty varied and diverse. Like you said, from cranberry harvesting to train rides and polar bears and tugboats and everything in between. So you, you have an honestly, honestly, though, my I think my my approach to doing the intros and to like trying to absorb that about one of our one of our guests on the show is sort of like the thing that you said in, in one of your videos. I'm going to sort of get ahead of myself here, but it was your tips for content creators video. And yeah. it was just about like sort of show what you want to shoot. And when I approach somebody's channel, I just sort of like gravitate towards the videos that you know stand out to me like i'm like oh bobsledding yeah that looks cool or the yeah. cranberry field i've always wondered what's going on with those cranberry fields exactly. there's so much water like that's exactly how i approach the channel and it just kind of works out yeah and that's what's happened with me uh i mean not to jump ahead of our podcasting questions but that's exactly what i went with was what am i interested in what are my curiosity and people are like you have to niche down to blow up kind of thing. And I didn't want to niche down to one segment because then I would be limited to only making videos on that topic. Whereas I am interested in how is a cranberry farm har or how are cranberries harvested on a farm? How do tugboats operate? What's it like to be in a bobsled? What's it like to go to the northern like communities and see polar bears? But if I had, I don't know, if I niched down, I would have limited myself. So this was my way of fighting that and still finding a way to make it work. So I guess the only unifying theme on my channel, I suppose, is me. But yeah, I would. That is a very unifying thing on your channel, and, and a sense of adventure, I, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say. I think. I think what it is is again. I'm going to quote you again, but I think it's the you mentioned it. It was on the Worth Hats website. You said that your focus of the channel is focusing on the amazing people and things that make the world yep. amazing. Yeah. And I think that's what unifies it for me is like, you're, I don't think that you really make it about yourself so much like, no. like other content creators do. It's about you sharing your passion. And that's not something that you're like pointing, like, look at me. It's like, look at exactly. that. That's really cool. You get yeah. it. It's not yeah. about me. I don't, I like, I, I feel like I don't put enough of myself into the videos. I really try and make it about either the person, the place or the technology or whatever it is I'm showing that's what's important. And it is, that's what the viewer has clicked to see. That's what the thumbnail's about and the title's about. So they, they want that, but I do need them to care enough about me, or at least find me interesting and engaging enough that they go, I like that guy. What else does he do? And then I can hook them into the channel, but I really don't like to make it about me. Yeah. I think you do. That's what point. I admire yeah, about really the channel. Good. Keen yeah. observer there. That was great. <laughs> yeah, very, very well said too. I would have said it way worse that I, I, but I do think that underlying thing within the channel is the sense of adventure because every one of those things is adventurous and it draws you in and, and there is a common theme within it. And mm -hmm. I guess the, that common theme is not only it's obviously you, but you have a sense of adventure and you've always had that yeah. from your past. And so we can start back, back there at, uh, you know, I'm going to butcher this name. Um, but so at Kitsilano? Yeah, Kitsilano. Secondary, Kitsilano, yeah. okay. Secondary school, go Kits, right? I couldn't Ooh. find out what a kit was. Um, looked hard. It, it's a, it, Kitsilano is a neighborhood in Vancouver. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, um, so 
it started out there, right? Well, it didn't start out there. You went to elementary school where you have your face. And if you want to learn more about his elementary school, go watch his wow, video. Wow, yes. Um, mosaic, for sure. Mosaic, yeah. And that was his first and last ever mosaic. Um, that's right. Have you done any? Have you done any since then? No, that's my only piece of public art on display. <laughs> well, you could, you could, uh, another great, you could uh, put up some public art like the guy did with a uh, um, chilling dude park. Oh, the Dude Chilling Park. Dude Chilling Park. Yeah. Yes. You could be, you know, Downey Live Park, put it outside your house or something. And That's maybe right. you could get your <laughs> second art installation. I'll come um, up something. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, so maybe we'll give you a couple here. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so the creed of the school is Fiat Lux. And I think it's really interesting that um, it's Fiat Lux because Drew and I's college is creed is Fiat Lux as well. And oh, I wanted yeah, to know funny. if that creed, um, Let There Be Light, has shaped your life at all or if it was important to you growing up. Not really. I was, no, I, I didn't take it so much to heart. I had my own values instilled by my parents and family. Uh, you know, the people you, sur you choose to surround your, yourself by. So friends in school, as well as kind of what courses did I want to take? Where did I want to be in the future? I didn't really use that at all as any sort of guiding light, if you will, to use the, the words themselves. So no. <laughs> Yeah, I would. I mean, it was a far stretch, but I wouldn't expect anything from your secondary school to be like that profound. Obviously, you're what, like right, uh, six to thirteen years old, maybe twelve years old. No, high school. Yeah, we're thirteen to eighteen, okay. kind of thing, or seventeen. Yeah, right. Secondary. I'm I'm thinking U.S. terms, I guess maybe, but secondary school is is high school. Yes. Okay. Cool. And so, so that also is where the film and television course is that that inspired kind of this draw to you but obviously you had some kind of desire to use a camera or you were involved with cameras and film before that so what what got you into watching film and then what also got you into using the technology behind film yeah i uh obviously enjoyed movies especially back then i mean this is i graduated high school in 2005 so this is early 2000s and we didn't have much like you you had one family home computer that you'd share with people youtube wasn't a thing so there, there was none of that so movies were your escape james bond movies like i wanted to be in theaters every time that came out i just remember that you make plans with your friends you'd have movie nights over at their house yeah. that's what it was all about and then when in grade 10 uh, there was a tv productions class offered i was essentially just kind of looking for a fun easy elective course and this sounded great sat down I'm like I just get to make videos and movies all day like perfect and they obviously teach you a lot of camera basics this was back when we were using the giant VHS cameras that you put over your shoulder <laughs> and it fits in a full VHS tape and then you had to record that over into an editing machine not a computer like a not an iMac like we have today but it was a an actual editing machine that was separate that attached to a monitor or a TV and so that's what I learned on. And then eventually iMacs were strong enough. And so we bought that and they had just released Final Cut Pro. And I started learning on that in grade 11 or 12, sort of my later years there. Um, but we would stay at school overnight editing our videos that were due the next day kind of thing. It just became so fun. It wasn't a slap it together and get a good mark. This was we took pride in these videos. We really had a lot of fun making them. They were so creative. We were allowed a lot of creative freedom. So we were just pushing the limits. What can we do? And eventually it led to us like staying, pulling all nighters at the high school, which I didn't even know you were allowed to do. Like the, we were, we felt like we were sneaking around because we'd lock the door and turn off the lights when we knew the janitor was coming around so that he'd lock <laughs> up the school and go home and we could stay and edit. Um, yeah, that's too funny. Definitely not something I would expect from a high school. It sounds like it's out of like a movie, you know? Exactly. Yeah. But that's like, what it was. And I thought nothing would come of it. I was like, that was fun. Those were great three years of, of TV productions, getting a really good mark on my electives course, pulled up my GPA, and that was it. A friend of my group, he went and took a film studies course in university, but the rest of us went on to do other stuff and thought nothing of it other than that was a fun time in our life. Yeah, and so I was pretty impressed by the films, though the the clips that you included on your channel. I forget which video exactly it was, but I was pretty impressed with it. Like the the oh, like yeah. Matrix move with the 
with oh, the trash yeah. can lid. It was it was pretty impressive for especially actual, being on all VHS recordings. Too. Yeah. Yeah, those little bullet effects took yeah. ages yeah. to put in back then. So and so, like my that's... my friend Ben would make would make the effects on Windows Paint and then we'd overlay it on top of things. Like you had to get so creative with how to make this work with the basic <laughs> editing technology you had back then. And that was like true, you're like truly splicing, cutting, putting pieces o- over it and recording onto the film itself. Uh, no, not quite to that degree. So okay. we, we, were, we were recording onto analog VHS tape and then record from that onto a digital editing device. So we were okay. digitizing it before editing it. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, okay. I was like, man, that, that had to be really hard. And I want to understand that because I have no concept of that whole process. Yeah. Now, luckily, the second year, grade 11, we got to move up to like DVS tapes, the little yep. ones that were more oh digital. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember so, all those, man. I had my first camera was like on the shoulder of my dad's. He gave it to me and rocking right. like the, the controls were on the front, like Zoom. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt awesome doing that. And then I got a DVS and I was filming skateboarding with my friends. That was the, yeah. the best way to do it. So those are the good old days. And so I forgot that, all these little baby steps and, and technological advancements along the way, going from on the shoulder to having it on your phone all the time. Oh, dude, remember I forget about first, all those things. The first digital, the first digital camera I got, the SD card was like this size. <laughs> oh yeah. It was like this size. And it, I, I I have it upstairs and I think it um I think it shot in 1.2 megapixels. And the wow. SD yeah. card was Oh man, I, I want to say it was like two twenty-eight, like megabytes, something like that, like yeah, four yeah. pictures, something, like that, something. Yeah. something stupid. But that, that's an, so. When you're 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 taking this class and you're creating like feature length esque films and the, coming up with the whole project, and in that sense, you've changed in a little bit. Now, is there a plan for you to eventually go back to those roots, or is that just? in the past now you you've moved away from the feature length and you like the newer kind of modern i i don't know if it's vlog style or different editing style yeah no i've never had an interest in film like traditional film of doing feature length or hollywood or or even documentary really intrigues me but i have an interest in these like faster paced more, I guess it, it, it's a middle range, somewhere between TikTok short and documentary long. I want enough time to give you all the information you need while keeping it short and to the point and get you to move on to the next one. I mean, there is definitely a business side. I have a business degree in marketing. And so the business side says that that's the best way to go with it. You know, the, the documentary viewer, you're only going to get them watching once. They may recommend it. Uh, obviously, documentaries and feature-length films still do well. But if you can have shorter content coming out week after week, you can have millions of people clicking on that every single week and continue to grow. And yeah, so there's and so yeah, the, no real interest for a longer. Well, that makes sense. And so, the, the I mean, the most recent YouTube change from 10 minutes to 8 minutes for... Uh, like some major monetization that must be a benefit to your channel and your mentality moving forward yeah yeah it is yeah so that class i looked on the class schedule of the school it's yeah. still available um, really yeah yeah i was pretty shocked uh actually i should say that his name's mr scott was the, the teacher he recently came across my youtube channel somehow clicked it naturally saw it was recommended to him goes I recognize that voice and immediately remembered my me and Torben and Ben, who I took the class with as a group. And he emailed me somehow. Uh, I guess he found it in my like YouTube about page and emailed me. He was like, not sure if you remember me. I'm like, of course I remember you, Mr. Scott. And uh, he, he was just really proud to see me succeeding and continuing in that realm that he had essentially taught me the basics of. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting, like full circle there. Dude, that's that's totally a cool story. I was I was definitely going to ask about him. I don't I don't know if I remember telling you on the pre-call, but I teach too. So I was de- when you called him out or like right. gave him the shout out in the video, I was like, that's super cool. I wonder whatever became of like that, just that I, that class and, and the legacy yeah. of it. He's not teaching anymore. He's I guess retired, but it's nice to hear the class is still there. You know, some other teacher decided that's to take it cool. on, or the school board thought it was important. 
and uh, nice to know that he's still out there and around and watching. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, it's got to anyway, be. Sorry, I didn't cut you off there. No, Michael. it's got to be the equivalent of like, uh, you know, having an acting class and then that actor going off and becoming, uh, you know, Broadway actor yeah. or a TV actor or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because your channel is yeah. significant in the sense of YouTube presence, right? And it, you call him out, right? Like it's pretty yeah. cool for him. Cool. I couldn't imagine Drew, you know, teaching Spanish and then later on some kid writes a novel in Spanish or something like that because he fell in love with the class, <laughs> right? So, That'd be great. That'd we be can awesome. hope. Yeah. So with this being said, one of the questions I want to ask is like, if you were talking to a kid today who's going to join this class, what would be some advice when joining the class? Don't listen to your teachers. Do whatever you want. I mean... <laughs> Listen I support that. This, yeah, <laughs> listen to them in the sense of uh, pick up the basics, learn what you need to learn so that you can get good at it. But don't listen to them about the rules of the industry or the rules or expectations of what you're supposed to do, because we've all seen that change over the years and someone has to be the one to change it. And you can be the person that does everything differently compared to, you know, you start putting out the short videos when everyone's putting out the long ones and they go, that'll never work. And the next thing you know, TikToks shows up and you're the one ready and blowing up. So do what works for you, do what you're passionate about. Others will find you. There will definitely be those who don't understand what you're doing, but you'll be laughing and proving them wrong in no time. So hang in there and do what you want. I think that's great advice. And I think, I think that's great. Just life advice, right? Follow yeah. your passion because I think that that I don't want to get too far ahead in the channel, but it's pretty common with those who are successful on YouTube is they're not doing something for the views. They're doing it for their passion, for what they love. And they're following their, you know, you could make documentary skill films. Yeah. You choose to do a, uh, it's, it's like a, a series or comp compilation of different documentaries on different items in your, in your yeah. channel. So. I want to, I want to ask a question here that is totally out of sync from what we usually do, but it's totally on topic with this because yeah that like it is a conscious choice what you're doing and you're you're sharing so much of your life with hundreds of thousands of people that you might not ever get to meet and i find that very interesting in in both i, I definitely want to hear your side of things but from a viewer side of things i was looking at your most recent video and there was a comment from a viewer named mike c and he was talking about the idea of how you provide something that so many of us, your viewers have needed to help us through like these rough times in the past year. And I was like, I totally relate to that because I feel the same exact way about the channels that I subscribe to. Right. Like you get that sort of sentimental connection with, with the people that you're watching on the screen and it becomes consistent and it becomes part of your routine and, and you get that connection to it. Yeah. So I was curious along this line of like, why, why are you so passionate about sharing your life through this medium? And why are you so passionate about doing this YouTube thing that what do you take away from that sort of dynamic? And what do you take away from those positive comments like that when you hear that you're making a difference in people's lives, however insignificant it might feel from your end of things, because that's one out of 177,000 or whatever it might be. But yeah. what, yeah, what's your perspective on that? <laughs> Don't uh, there. When, when I, started the channel I had zero subscribers and then eight subscribers and 20 subscribers and at the beginning it was just to film fun things and really leverage this channel as a way to get to do the unique stuff that no one else is allowed to do example riding on a tugboat or get to go to the cranberry farm and see how they harvest it or whatever it is these uh, to the top of our Canadian Parliament building to change the Canadian flag. Like these are things that people are not allowed to do, the general public. So this was kind of a way for me to weasel my way in to do those things. Now, as the channel's grown, uh, it's been, it's, it's more beneficial for me because then it's bigger and has more presence and I'm able to do more things, but also it's a lot more fun for me to bring people along. But as 2020 hit, uh, everything closed down. You know, my mental health took a hit when I wasn't allowed to do what I love. I'm not allowed to travel. I'm not allowed to showcase any of the sites around Vancouver or businesses because they're all closed, et cetera. Um, it really forced me, I, I've committed to putting out one video a week. So this forced me to get out there and continue to do these things. So there's a lot of like internal personal reasons of why I do this. And the side effect, I guess, is the fact that these people 
do build an attachment with me, which is what I want because that keeps them coming back every week. But I, I didn't realize the impact that I would have on these people. And it's been very eye-opening for me. At the beginning, it's a, it's a few people and you're so excited about it because that's what I want. And these people are connecting great. And when you only have 2000 subscribers, every single one of them really matters and they all still really matter. But there are those that have now been watching for three years and are, are very invested. And there are those that are just joining. Um, but the messages, just to give some context, I've, I've grown significantly this year. I, I've been doing YouTube for four years, but in the last year, I grew from 40,000 to 175,000, now 170. So it's been big growth this year and uh, 2020 being one of the toughest years for a number of people, whether they lost their job or whatnot. The number of messages outpouring to me, thanking me for what I do or the positive impact I have on their day just once a week has been really shocking to me. I did not expect that. And I have been recognized out and about, or I have people that message me regularly on, on Instagram. And so the, the effect, honestly, it feels like it puts a lot more pressure on me. And some weeks I feel like I don't deserve that pressure or that I, you know, like I, I'm, I feel like I'm still the same person. I still feel like I'm that YouTuber with 8,000 subscribers fighting to get every single view I can. And I haven't relented or relaxed that feeling yet. I haven't sat back and looked and gone, wow, look what I've accomplished. And so it's really weird when these people reach out to me. I'm like, who am I to these people? But it's, it's because I don't see them, but they see me every week. Uh, so it's really nice. I just haven't figured out how to understand it or accept it yet. But hopefully we get there. Hopefully we, I don't know. I think the mentality yeah. 8,000 subscribers and always thinking that you're going to the core if that doesn't change you're going to always bring on new people and the the 167,000 other subscribers will feel like they're always in that 8,000 yeah I hope so so I, I want to go back to back to grade school and high school and famously you played field hockey but I have an inkling of and that that's in uh, if you watch his about him video Right. I'm going to guess you played field hockey and tell me if I'm wrong because you played hockey at, in, in the winter and they translated equally. So yeah, like you're, you're translating the skills in the summer and you get to be outside on a grass turf in spring and yeah. doing that. Is that, yeah. is that why you played field hockey? Yeah, I was in baseball first and I hated it. I was literally lying down in the outfield. I was so bored. I was picking the clovers because no kid could hit it out into the outfield at that age. And I hated it. And so I was looking for a different sport. And I guess my parents had just put my sister into field hockey and there was a guy's team and they were like, you want to play that? I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And it was pretty good. And so, cause I did play ice hockey at the time. So some transferable skills there. And so I just kind of stuck with it, loved it. Got to a point where I was playing high level ice hockey and high level field hockey and kind of had to choose which direction I was going to go. This is late high school age. And I chose field hockey because it's more of an international sport and would have me traveling around the world. So I made the well, team BC and went to nationals and we won that. And then eventually I made the junior national team. Uh, but prior to that, I did go with the BC team to the Netherlands to play in a tournament oh. out there. Cool. And uh, things were, were looking good until we didn't make the junior world cup. And so they kind of disbanded the team to rebuild it with a younger, you know, guys that would be of the right age for the next junior world cup uh, but i have friends that i played with that have been to three olympics because of it no and, way yeah. very cool and so it's easy for me to say oh i, I could have been on the team when I, once we got disbanded that's when i started working just out, out of high school and they kept continued to practice and try out for the national team etc uh, and eventually they obviously made it Whereas I yeah, started traveling and started my other, other work and yeah. went a different path. But That's a pretty cool. No I, I see that that is much more insight into, I just thought, you know, maybe played a little field hockey on a team. I didn't know yeah, it was wow. that, that serious. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, I will add that, I, but for work, not for field hockey. So yeah, in, indirectly. Okay, so there's another part of your life Rose. that is, yeah, you did freeze a little bit, but I think we got the message okay. there. I, 
you 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 love hockey and you love field hockey, but you also are an advocate and a very uh, good um, ultimate frisbee player. Yes. Uh, how did you fall in love with? Is this post field hockey? And then you you start playing ultimate frisbee. How do you find yourself being the operations manager for the Vancouver Nighthawks, which is a professional yeah. uh, ultimate frisbee team? Which I didn't know that they were this big, but then MKBH is on like a professional team. There's it's a pretty big sport. So there's another <laughs> there's another big YouTuber that's a professional ultimate uh, ultimate frisbee player, MKBHD. Yeah, he plays on a professional ultimate frisbee team. <laughs> That doesn't mean that all ultimate frisbee players are YouTubers and all YouTubers are ultimate frisbee players, but there's, there were two of us. Um, this actually, <laughs> it all goes back to Kitsilano High School again. I picked up ultimate frisbee, joined the ultimate frisbee team in high school there and learned the basics of the sport and started to play. And obviously that was just for fun. It was once a week after school and was focused on field hockey and other sports, but Many years later, once field hockey had dwindled and I was focused on other things, I had a friend who was playing recreational ultimate frisbee and said, hey, do you want to join our team it's once a week? I said, yeah, sure. Show up, play. Had a really good time. We were pretty good. We moved up into the competitive league and it's a very big league. Actually, it's the Vancouver Ultimate League is what it's called. And it's North America's largest recreational sport league. Wow. So wow. <laughs> there, I think there's 5,000 participants. So it's a big. Holy cow big thing out here. Um, And I was, I was pretty good. And we actually had, uh, there's two competing professional ultimate Frisbee leagues. There's the major league ultimate MLU and the AUDL, which is the American ultimate disc league. And they both started at the same time. And Vancouver had two teams. We had one in each league. So it it unfortunately (laughs) split our talent pool into, and it also split our fans into. So both teams were kind of struggling financially, but I became the, well, the Vancouver Nighthawks were looking for an operations manager and I had operations experience from other jobs that I'd had and uh, I applied, I got the job and I did that for a year and was hired to do it again for the second year, but then the league folded right before the beginning of the season. Oh, and okay. so the AUDL won and they're still running. But, uh, <laughs> That's I'll a say pretty... it wasn't because of my fault. No, no. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you had something to do with it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's pretty interesting, though. So, you you turned a, a once again, you turned a passion into work, and I think that 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 goes through. And so, I want to talk about college, but I also want to talk about your storied past, right? So, you have a lot of jobs on your LinkedIn, and yes. they are all over the place, and some of them are are not on there. So, you've been a valet, you've been a cashier at Nestor's. I'm gonna guess that's a grocery store. I don't it know. Is, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, you were a day camp section director for the YMCA for the summer camp. It was for four months. Um, yeah. I'm just taking a guess on the summer camp as well because it's four it months. Was, uh, yeah. So you were a social media translator. You worked at nonprofits like the Hearing Foundation of Canada and Step Into Action. You've yeah. also had corporate jobs, right? You, we just talked about the Nighthawks and we talked about you know Diamond Integrated Marketing, which was, um, I think, yeah. one job that you were let go from. So. Yes. When you go back to your younger self and you were to look at all of the jobs, including, I think you worked in, uh, I don't know what the politically correct was, you worked for a trash company, right? Yeah, yeah. It was Waste called, management it was like, is the- uh, Trash It, yeah, a junk yeah. removal company. Junk yeah. removal. Yeah. So from all of the, the careers and paths that you've had, what would you go back and tell younger Mike to say, hey, this is, is going to teach you something great and then go back to yourself and say, this is a stupid job. Don't do this. Just It's going to give you nothing. Just walk away and go do something else. No job gives you nothing. Even if you hate it, it teaches you to you know, do something you hate if you have to, if it's going to get you somewhere. Like Every job has a purpose, whether it's just to bring you enough money to save up so you can quit to do something else, which for me was the 604 Trash It job. I saved up and worked there while I started the YouTube channel until I could quit at the moment that the channel was, was doing well enough. Um, I've had other, basically, you're going to get to my, my university career here in a second. And it took me 13 years to finish my bachelor's of business administration. So a four year degree took me 13 years because there was always (laughs) something that I would take a semester off for. 
there was some unique opportunity that would come up and I would go, oh, that, that's worth it. School will always be there. You can always go back to a university. That's not going anywhere. And so I would take this job and that would introduce me to this person, which eventually would lead me to another job or would teach me this skill. And then I can put that on my resume and leverage to get the next job and whatnot. And now here we are many years later and I'm in a job, I have a, I'm a small business owner that is in a career or an industry that did not exist 15 years ago when I was going yeah, to university. So if I had followed you know, a set career path and gone to school. I mean, I have plenty of friends that have a master's degree and then they've gone, I don't want to do that. And they've now had to start over and take a, a trades school or, or whatever it was to follow the real passion. So I just took the opportunity whenever I could. This is a unique, interesting opportunity, like helping this doctor run across Canada. I volunteered to help him for three weeks. So I was flown out to the Maritimes, uh, to Newfoundland, our most remote province, pretty much because I'd never seen it. And uh, it was all for a good cause, raising money for prostate cancer. But in doing that, I was supposed to come back to start my next semester of school. And he was kind of like, while I was there, I started their blog for them, which was big at the time, as well as ran all their social media and was essentially the operations manager for them on the road. So he would run eight hours a day. He was running 50 to 80 kilometers a day, which wow. is 30 to 50 miles, I should say. So a significant distance. So he's on the road running eight hours a day while I would be calling hotels in advance up ahead to see if we could stay the night or campgrounds where we could you know, dump our RV or fill it with water. I was calling radio stations, prepping interviews for him, uh, doing everything on the road as well as running social media and other avenues that he couldn't manage while he was running. So he eventually said, can you stay longer? Can you do the entire run if, if there was a, a company backing all of the expenses so that any money brought in to the charity would go directly to the charity and stay there. And so they were willing to put up the money to pay me to, to continue on for the rest of the run. So I was with him for five months. So I postponed my school semester wow. to just stay with him and have that experience. Oh, cool. And then because of that experience, I was able to put that on my resume and was hired by Diamond Integrated Marketing, the experiential marketing agency that was looking for an operations yeah. manager that was able to drive a large vehicle from festivals across provinces. And basically I got to work from home every weekend would drive to, you know, to Calgary or to Edmonton to the folk music festival. And I would set up this trailer and that led me to I mean, that gave me all the experience I needed for everything YouTube wise that wasn't video related. It was all marketing and business and every, every step leads to the next thing and you never know where it's going to end up. So the super interesting outlook on college, because I would have never, ever, ever thought of it that way, but it truly is like, you can always go back to it. Yeah. You can take an experience here, take something there. And I think it's a, uh, it's extremely interesting because I, I know so many people, I know a few, I wouldn't say so many, but I do know a few people who have gone and gotten a master's and then hated what they did. Now they, you know, they worked at Olive Garden as a server or something like that. I'm like, you just have $300,000 of schooling and yeah. at Olive Garden. It's interesting. When I, when I was hired by Diamond Integrated Marketing, I actually wasn't looking for the job, but a friend who worked there recommended me for it. And so I went in for the job interview, not really looking for a job, but it was just so up my alley and exactly what I wanted to be doing. It sounded so fun and it paid well. Everything was great. I was like, this would be perfect on my resume. It's kind of the world of marketing I wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. And so I took the job, was, was very good at it, but then was taking a marketing course in my bachelor's of business administration degree. And at the beginning of the semester, you all go around and kind of say what you do. And I told her what kind of job it was. So when it came to the guerrilla marketing week that she was teaching guerrilla marketing, she actually had me come up in front of the class and talk for 40 minutes and answer questions about what we do because I was actually in that world where she was just teaching it out of the textbook and didn't have yeah. any experience in that world. That's great. That's awesome. So there's value. Yeah, there's yeah. value there. Very much so. And so one thing that happened with the Diamond Integrated is you were let go. And I think that's something maybe even today is much more important to talk about than any yeah. other time. And so 
I feel like there's two paths that you can take from this is get down in your dumps and drive yourself somewhere negative or what you did. And it seems like you took this and said, Hey, maybe this is the right time. And you took it as an opportunity to go and take all that you learned and move forward. So what was the biggest thing you learned from being laid off? When you're right, when you get laid off, you, you can get depressed about it. You can look for another job immediately, right in the same field. And I decided to step back and take a breather. I mean, I was given a severance package. So I go, okay, I've got, you know, two to four weeks. I don't remember how long it was to kind of think about what, what do I want to be doing before I just jump back and start applying for the same job for at different companies? What is it I really want to be doing? And it was at that time that I was watching YouTube and travel vloggers were, were, were starting to become a thing. YouTubers were becoming a business or they were making money. And I noticed that I was no longer watching traditional television the way I had before. I was now watching Netflix and we were starting to follow in quotation marks what were called influencers. And I didn't want to be an influencer, but there was one YouTuber, Lost LeBlanc, who put out a video that described how he made money. And as he laid it all out, it clicked with my business degree. I just went, I understand all of that. I think I can do that. And it was at that same time, once I was laid off, I actually decided quickly to book a trip with a friend and off we went. And when I got back from that trip, Every single night of that week, I was editing the video and was like, I really enjoy this. I mean, I would waste my evenings editing these videos instead of being out with friends and whatnot. And I was like, there's got to be a way I can make some money doing this. And that's when I saw that video. And that's when it all came together. And I said, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And I changed my YouTube channel. I, I still have it. There's one out there called Michael Downey, which was just my personal channel, putting out videos of memories of trips with friends and whatnot but that wasn't audience focused. And so with this business perspective, I knew I needed to be making videos for viewers, not for myself. And that's when I started the whole new channel, Downey Live, and um, went from there. Everything was targeted and focused and strategic. And I liked the, the image of the full circle of spending late nights in high school locked in the room hiding from the janitor <laughs> yes. editing videos to doing the same thing doing Nothing the same changes. thing a few years later that's pretty cool <laughs> and you you may have just answered the question that i wanted to ask getting here but i wanted to go to a specific moment which was you mentioned after a year of working while starting your youtube channel you got to about 1.6 thousand subscribers yeah and at that point you decided to quit your job, quit your yep. major source of income and just yep. focus right on the YouTube. I was curious what gave you the confidence to make that decision, to take that risk. It seems like it may have been your business awareness and recognizing like, oh, I can turn that into something sustainable. It's not just yep. a, it's not just a pipe dream. No, I purposely took the 604 trash it job, a junk removal job. I was 29 years old. I took it. And it just felt really demeaning to be a 29 year old guy, just, just graduated with my business degree. And now I'm, I'm moving down to a basic entry level job, but it was purposeful in wanting a job that I would hate. I wanted to dislike it so that I would be willing to quit it at any moment, mm. whether like as soon as the channel started to bring in enough finances or enough revenue to be able to quit, I wanted out. The focus was to make YouTube work. And so this was my way to push myself to make it happen faster by wow. hating what I did. And <laughs> the other part was it was mindless. And so I would go home at the end of the night and not be mentally drained because it was pretty, okay. pretty brain dead job. So there was that. And uh, it, I really liked the people I worked with, which made it easier during the day. But I disliked the work, which pushed me to want to get out of there. Mm -hmm. And I got to that point when... It was about 10 months after I'd started my channel. It was at 604 Trash for about 10 months. And it was a combination of finally having my, my first freelance or my second freelance gig. So a client's project on my laptop, ready to be edited, but instead I'm out there working. And also I wasn't making enough money to really save up a lot of money. I was getting by and it was saving enough money to do these trips and YouTube stuff I wanted to, but it wasn't getting ahead. And it was getting to that break point where if I quit, so in the end, what I did, there was just one terrible day where it was the messiest, grossest job site, pouring rain, and I'm training a new guy that was really annoying. It was, 
I'd had bad job <laughs> sites. I'd had rainy days. I've trained you guys, but this was the combination of all three where I just went, I don't need this. I'm out of here. I've got a client project waiting at home. I should be focused on that. And so it was one o'clock in the afternoon. It was midday, mid shift. And I drove back to the office and I walked up to the boss and I said, I'm really sorry. It's nothing personal. You're a great guy, but here are the keys. I cannot get back in the truck. I'm going home. And I purposefully burnt that bridge because I didn't want to go back two weeks later and say, Hey, is there any part-time work? Like mm -hmm. I, I knew what I was doing and burning that bridge. I could not go back and I did not want to. So I went home, finished the client projects, continued on that. Um, and I took out a loan and I said, I, because I was working 50 hours a week for this guy, I only had evenings and weekends and I had a girlfriend. I had to spend some time with her as well. And I was still <laughs> playing ultimate Frisbee twice a week. Um, so I wasn't putting enough time and effort into this YouTube channel. And I only had, like you said, 1,600 subscribers. And that is not going to get me ahead. I needed to commit more time to it to grow faster and make this possible. So I took out a loan of what I thought I could live off for a year, which was about $25,000. And I gave myself a year. And after a year, I was now at 5,000. And I was like, oof, I'm not really far enough ahead. But I had had more client work that was sustaining me as well. And that December when I was considering, is it enough? Is it not enough? That's when my channel took a spike and I jumped from 5,000 to 10,000 subscribers in one month. And with that came a lot of views, which means more revenue. And I said, okay, well, we'll keep going. Let's see how long this lasts. And it's just a matter of keep going, keep going. And it's, it's now here we are. I Do you remember that, what it was that caused that? I mean, that's that's a big increase from 5,000 to 10,000, just doubling your subscriber base in a month. What it, caused it, the jump? I'm pretty sure it was a video I'd come out with February of the, so this was uh, coming into December and I'm pretty sure it was a video I'd made in February, which was at the end of the ski season. But now that it was December, the beginning of the ski season, that video was taking off and blowing up and people liked interesting. it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You While we're know. talking about making videos, I wanted to ask about your sort of your creative process, sort of getting back to what we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the video, which was like showing what you want to shoot and sharing your passions with people. And yeah. so the question I wanted to ask was more logistical in terms of how you make these things work. Like specifically, I'm thinking of the cranberry harvesting video. And as I'm watching it, I'm just like, this is so cool. And this is something that I would never just have the idea pop into my head. Like I should just go and see if I can get on one of these farms and show the process. Right. How does that work for you from like ideation to actual execution? What's the process for you? The best example I have is the tugboat video, which was one of my first ones to, to do well because it's so niche no one sees how they work. So we have river tugboats here that go up mm -hmm. and down. They pull log booms, they pull barges, all sorts of stuff. And literally was, I think I was driving a friend to the airport and was going over the bridge and looked down in the river and there's a little tugboat pulling a log boom along. And I go, Jeff, I've always wondered what that's like, you know, since you're a little kid kind of thing. And I'm like, now's the time I should see what that's like. I, I can do that. So I, I look up seven tugboat companies in the area that I could find. I mean, None of them have great websites because they're not looking for consumers like you and I. They <laughs> yeah, really yeah, have yeah. their own customers. They don't need to impress any of us. So there's no reason for them to say yes to this too because I'd only become a liability by being on board. Yeah. But I email seven tugboat companies. Four of them got back to me. Three of them said, no, we're not interested. And one <laughs> of them said, yeah, sure, come on by. We're a little family tugboat, a little family run tugboat company. Sure, come on board. And there was nothing beyond that. It was like, great, what time do you need me where? Like, that's all I want to know. I just had my GoPro and I think that was it back in the day. So they're like 6 a.m., show up at this location. So perfect, I get there. There's a crew, you know, a bunch of guys are going out to their tugboats. They stick me on this little boat, uh, not a tugboat, like a speedboat. And it's okay. taking us out to the tugboat because their tugboats run 24 hours a day. They fill up enough fuel that they can run nonstop for like a week. Wow. And so I didn't realize that I had signed up for a 12 hour shift and I did not, <laughs> I did not bring lunch. I didn't bring water. I didn't bring anything, but 
<laughs> you know, the guys are gr nice. And we just happened to, after six and a half hours of being on this boat together, I mean, at this point, my camera batteries are dead. Oh, yeah. uh, but I was able to charge them in there. They have a little kitchen on the tugboat and everything. But sure enough, they were like, hey, we actually rarely don't have anything we're pulling at the moment. And we're going to go past the shop. Do you want us to drop you off? I was like, yes, please. Thank you for having me. But seven hours is enough. I've got all the footage I need. <laughs> Um, that's a great story that's really so to, cool to answer your question about operationally now it's changed that was two or three years ago when i did that one i liked Damn. going in blind not knowing anything about it because then my my reaction is genuine every yeah. time something happens so in that tugboat i didn't know that we still have guys running out onto log booms and grabbing the chains out of the water and physically attaching them and unattaching them and running along logs and i was like he could fall in at any moment sure enough he fell in the water and he brings three changes of clothes and they've got the <laughs> oven on in the little kitchen. He's drying off his pants over the oven. Like it was, I had no idea that stuff happened. So I like that reaction, but it also pays to be prepared. And so nowadays I'm a little bit more aware of what I'm going into. Um, and yeah, it's basically just email whoever you want to work with. And when they say no, they absolutely have a competitor that wants to get a leg up on them that will say yes to having you. Yeah, a hundred percent. Everyone has a competitor, and everyone there's not there's not not one person in any industry. So, like no. you said, it's all about throwing out the numbers. You got seven people. Yeah, one of them is bound to say yes, and literally one out of seven did. Well, that's but it. We had. A, well, I was going to say we have another. Pardon me, another, I wanted to ride along with a snow groomer and kind of see how that all works. And yeah. so I reached out to the biggest ski resort here, which is Whistler, which hosted the Olympics here in Vancouver. And they said, no, they said, sorry, we only work with influencers of 50,000 subscribers or more. <laughs> and I think I had, you know, 2000 at the time. And I, in my head, I was like, okay, I'll remember that for one day. Yeah. yeah. But of course you go to the competitors. We have many other small resorts here and they loved the idea. And they're like, what else can we have you do? You can ride with our snowmakers. You can ride with our, and oh, I got to make cool. all these videos with these guys. They treated me like a king. I was like, why would I ever want to go back to Whistler? Come to these guys. <laughs> it's the same grooming machine. The viewer yeah. has the same experience. It's no different. That's so true. I was in disbelief with the crane operation. Because oh. I was like, this this just seems, like you said before, you just become a liability. And that is like right. such an extreme liability. Seriously. And the guy's just kind of like chilling in the background, watching you sit in the control chair. Like, they're like, you, you keep the you hat on your way out. Yeah. <laughs> the only re requirement was I needed to have a fall protection certification. And I was like, how do I get that? And they go, oh, it's an online <laughs> course. It costs $40. And I sat there for 30 minutes and then got certified to go up this 200 foot crane. It was like, <laughs> I should not be allowed, but thank you very much. Yeah. I guess they checked yeah. the liability box though. Like, Hey, he's fall, he's fall correction certified. He's good to go. I guess. Uh, and that, uh, that $40 course has uh, earned me 600,000 views, I think off that video and a lot more right money on. than That's I invested cool perspective. in. That. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's just so the, the ideas are cool. And I, I feel like on the same path here, you, in your Q and a, you just released, you talked about your bucket list and you pulled up your phone and you have, you know, the ones you've checked off. And so do you, do you use the same kind of methodology? You're driving, you see something, Hey, that'd be cool. I'm going to write yeah. down my phone. You're always keeping a list of ideas so that you have a bank. And I'm sure 2020 exactly. that bank has, has really come in handy because you live in a great area. I really, when I started the channel and I was wanted to do these behind the scenes things, there were really just a few things that I wanted to do. I wanted to ride a tugboat. I wanted to ride up front in a train and ride in a helicopter and on a hovercraft. I think those were kind of the four things. And obviously there'd be other things like, oh, I'd love to ride in a fire truck or go along to a lot of other things, construction, crane, all those ideas come to you and you start adding, adding them to the list and then checking them off. I was really worried that I was going to run out of things. Eventually I would have done all of the things now luckily the world continues to move forward and progress and there's always some piece of new technology and i'm like oh great now i'm riding an electric motorcycle which is one of the first out yeah. and that video was one of my first to hit a million views and so there's always something new to come out that will continue to become available and with that is also locations in the world they have so many different ways they operate than we do here in canada and so i'm able to expand that way which has been great but it's definitely 
adding to the list, checking them off as I go along, or just sometimes my mind changes and I go, yeah, I really don't think that's a good video because my, the way I made videos three years ago was what do I want to do? And now I'm much more business focused and go, what's the thumbnail? What's the title? What do I, which videos do I think will do well? And I always see the positive regardless. So I can always find an angle of going, I, I do want to do that. It's pretty, pretty wide open. I'll do almost anything. So yeah, I'm, and I would say that's something I'm trying to watch to make sure that I do do things that I enjoy and not only doing it for the views, but it is difficult when it's my sole income that you do. Yeah. Want. You're, you're very yeah. conscious of that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so going back to that, what you just said, right? The electric motorcycle um, hitting a million coming from the, the whole path that we talked about, like, you know, eight subscribers to 1.6, thousand or 1600 subscribers to 5,000 to 10,000 subscribers. Now you're in your mind. Now you're kind of moving this needle. What was it like when you hit your first? So you have, uh, I think five, six videos, five videos with, um, over a million, one that's just knocking on the door. So what was it like when the first one hit a million? Well, it's funny because the first one, isn't up there anymore. I've made it private, really? but it was um, Canada legalized marijuana back in 2018. I want to say we were the second country in the world to make recreational marijuana fully legal. I personally didn't smoke at the time because it was illegal. I still, I still don't, mm-hmm. just, but that's fine. Um, but I was very curious. I was like, oh, this is a new thing, and it was going to be government regulated. So it's like, how do you buy this? And that was the confusion a lot of people had or whatnot. So I said, you know what, I'm going to buy a joint online legally from the government, it will be mailed to my house. And I'm going to show you what the process is like. And that's the video six minutes. And I don't smoke the joint because like, I didn't even (laughs) want to, I actually gave it away to a friend. But that video, I guess, was interesting to enough people around the world going, it was titled, you know, how to buy legal marijuana or from the government or something <laughs> along those lines. But people watched the full six minutes because they wanted to see me light up eventually. And they got <laughs> so mad at me in the comments because I didn't, that they were so angry in the comments that that spurred the algorithm going, oh, everyone's leaving a comment. This must be great. And it continued to show it to more and more people. So that blew up to about 950,000 in, I don't know, four and five months at the time, which was a lot and very fast. But uh, I was kind of signing with the management creator group at the time. And they recommended that I put it on private because it, it led myself to possibly some copyright, not copyright claims, but infringing on the YouTube um, terms and conditions kind mm-hmm. of thing of, mm-hmm. of even though I didn't use the drugs on camera and even though they are legal in Canada they were like you're just opening yourself up to a possibility so I said you know what I got a million views out of it I got what I needed out of it and I will say the revenue on it was very low because there were no advertisers that wanted yeah. to advertise in front of a marijuana video and so I made hardly any money off of it anyhow but uh, <laughs> that was that was the first one and that was a bit of a shock. And it was like, okay, <laughs> do I want to anger people? Because that seemed to work in the comments, but I don't want to be <laughs> that guy. And so I didn't follow that path. So Just then the second guess. video to hit. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it must have hit a different way in that sense of like, <laughs> you, you're using your positive message or you're coming yeah. up with something that one of your ideas that really is, is full fulfilling here. So what was that what was that feeling like? Well, the next one was this electric motorcycle one where a friend of mine, she rides motorcycles and she had actually test ridden the Harley Davidson Livewire, which was another electric mm-hmm. motorcycle. So I thought, oh, I want to go test drive this electric motorcycle. Why don't I bring her along? She can kind of compare or give some feedback, comparison with the other one. And so brought her along with the video and put her in the thumbnail. Well, compared to all of the other motorcycle review videos for that motorcycle she's she's quite an attractive young lady and uh anyway (laughs) that thumbnail seemed to work better than any of the other thumbnails for that motorcycle and while my channel wasn't very big there were some very big motorcycle channels that were reviewing that motorcycle and mine would come up in the recommended bar and most people would click that and so it's a matter of in that case it wasn't 
I wasn't in the browse category. It was mostly from recommended. So mm -hmm. it actually didn't take off very early right away because I was one of the first to kind of review that motorcycle. And it was six months later when these bigger channels were doing it, that's when it took off. It seems like timely events and yeah. to, they help to drive the, the viewership. Um, and so how does that affect the remaining part of your channel, right? Because I, I would imagine there's nothing timely about a 46 hour uh, Amtrak <laughs> video, right? Like no one, no one's like, Ooh, I'm, I'm about to take that train in two weeks. I got to watch the video, right? Not many, not many people yeah. as, as opposed to like the electric bike that's coming out. Maybe I want to buy it, the, that, that kind of draw. So how do you manage that? So, so I'll say this, I took, I took the marijuana video and I took the electric motorcycle video as kind of one-offs. And I was lucky to get those viewers and I was lucky to get those spikes. And those happened at times when I needed them. Again, back to when my, the end of my first year of the channel, I had 1,500, 1,600 subs. And it was that December, one of those videos took off and I jumped to 3,000 subs in a month. And then worked my way up to 5,000 by that second December. And again, it was another video that jumped and I hit that 10,000 mark. So each of these big videos hit at a moment, a critical moment where I was considering, is this going to work or is this not going to work? And every single time when I asked that question, I said, let's just go a little bit longer. Within a week, one of those videos would hit and save my channel in quotation marks. So, but those were one-offs. I'm not going to make any more marijuana videos. I wasn't going to make any more electric motorcycle reviews. So. I'll just take them for what they were. Thank you for saving me and we'll keep going. But the Amtrak one, so I think four out of the six million view videos I have are Amtrak or train related videos. The first Amtrak ride I took was, I went down to San Francisco for a friend's wedding. I, we drove down, we rented a car, drove down and my friends flew back and I could have also flown back, but I had nothing I needed to be back for. So why don't I take my time? I'm a YouTuber. I'll, take the train. It's a different mode of transportation. I'd never taken the train before in North America to get anywhere. It was like, you know, I'll just get to sit, I'll edit, I'll relax, and I'll get home. Anyway, very hungover from the wedding, did not want to make a video, <laughs> but I had to tell myself, this is my job. I have to make a video. So I did. I filmed the experience, put the video out. It did well within the first two weeks. I think it got 200,000 views, which was very good for my channel. Yeah. But over the next six months, it grew to 600,000 views, which was one of the bigger videos on my channel. I went, wow, there's something here. People really like this video. And at the same time, I was planning another trip to see a friend in Austin, Texas. So I said, instead of flying directly to Austin, Texas, I'll fly to New Orleans and I'll take the Amtrak from New Orleans to Austin. Again, another 24 hour trip. And I'm going to replicate exactly what worked on that train video. So I used almost the same thumbnail. I have like the same facial expression, the same angle of the train, same type of titling. It was, uh, you know, 24 hours in coach class. And the other one was 24 hours in business class. I kept it very much the same. And that second Amtrak video hit a million views in three weeks because all of those viewers had watched that original video. And now they're getting the same cues that made them click on that first video to click on this one. And I use the same editing style with the same type of intro and same type and all of it. And it worked very well. Those videos not only did well in terms of bringing in a million views, but they also drove a lot of subscribers at a very high subscriber to view rate. That marijuana video, it brought in a million views, but it didn't bring in the thousands. Yeah. Like, like that first Amtrak video brought in 25,000 subscribers from a million views. And so again, that was over Christmas and my channel, that helped my channel to double. Again, that was one of those moments. Yeah. You're like, great, when that hits in three weeks and your channel's grown by 25,000 subs and you only had 30, that's a pretty good month. Um, and again, with that comes a lot of money as well. And so, okay, let's try it again. So we tried another Amtrak one and that, so that's my third trip. And that just hit a million views as well on one of them. And I actually split that into two parts. And I was able to leverage that with a sponsor and go, hey, sponsor, I've done two of these Amtrak videos that have each gotten a million views. I'm going to do it again. I know it's going to get another million views. So I'm going to charge you this. What do you think? And they were like, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. And I said, it's going to get a million views. And they said, okay. And sure enough, here we are. And I actually split it into two parts. 
because I did start to get worried. I said, maybe I overpromised and won't deliver. <laughs> So I, I split it into two parts. So it's part one, part two. And I, I put the sponsor into both videos uh, in good faith, hoping that one of them would do well. And of course, the part one did a million views. I think part two is getting close to 650,000 or 700,000. So yeah, anyway. closer to seven. And you're yeah. wearing the hat. You're wearing the hat in both. I'm wearing the sponsor's hat in yeah. both. Yeah, uh, they're, they're very happy and they've been reaching out to me to do more with them. So it all worked out for awesome. both of us that's amazing and and so like the the second thing that i think is a growth factor is um uh oh my gosh this would be great if i knew theater language over your left shoulder stage left uh, yeah that's it uh yeah to the yeah behind you there's a plaque let's talk about that thing that one Ooh. right there yeah so going from the, the this climb when you got that in the mail what was it like this, I, I hold it proudly in front of you, as you can see, as soon as you mentioned it, I'm not like, oh, that old thing. I am proud <laughs> of this because like I said, I, I went to university for 13 years to get to my degree that I didn't even go to my graduation for. I did not walk across the stage because I didn't care about my degree. I, I, was, I felt like I was forced into it, not forced into it. I always, as a kid, were told to go to university. That's the right path, et cetera. So we're, we're trained to want to go to university and go with your friends and have that great experience. But once I'd started postponing that and postponing semesters and, and really dragging it out, I had so many other goals and ambitions that I was passionate about that it was becoming a drag to just finish it and get the piece of paper. And once I did, I was done with it. I wasn't excited about it or, or, or happy or proud. But this, this is something that I worked at from the beginning to get this plaque. I built this 100% on my own you know, support from friends and family, sorry, support from friends and family, absolutely. But this was blood, sweat and tears, quitting in the middle of the day, taking out a loan, betting on myself and learning the entire way, putting everything I've learned through those many unique opportunity jobs I had from university, from life experiences into play and seeing it pay off. So it, it means a lot, it means a lot. I mean, it's well earned, very well earned. And, and, and you can see like the meticulous nature through all of this, right? Your thumbnails, the thought process to getting to, to different places. And so, um, I mean, I, I only have a few more questions. Drew, do you have, where are you at with questions? I was, I was going to say now is usually the time when we ask like, all right, so what's next for your channel? But we have to keep in mind that we are talking to the gentleman that ends every video by saying, <laughs> I, don't I don't know where, where I'm, I'm going, going next. next. But I know I'm either with me. Yeah, That's so right. so I'm I'm a little hesitant to ask. Well, where's your channel going next? But I okay. would like to hear sort of what you yeah. would like to see done with your channel, what your next milestones before, are, next goals. Before we do that, I, I've got I've got two. Right. So I got right. two, so, okay. so two questions. I don't want to I want to make sure we leave that towards the end. Um, so wh where do your affinity and love for trains come from? Because it feels like it's really started to create an underlying category. I guess now there's a third leg yeah. to the stool on the channel itself, right? right? Travel, adventure, behind the scenes, and then trains. Wh where I did would say you're absolutely right with calling it the third leg of the stool. But what's really interesting is I never had a passion for trains. I was always a car guy into sports cars and Eventually that kind of weaseled its way into motorcycles, which I never knew I really liked until I, I bought one and now I absolutely love it and want to do a lot more motorcycle trips. The train thing was literally, like I said, it's an alternative mode of transportation to get me from this wedding in San Francisco back to Vancouver, something that I had no rush to do. So great, let's do it. Then I saw some success in that video. For me, it was the adventure. It's a unique, different adventure. And so anyway, when that video did well and I did all the others and those videos started to do very well, I said, great, I have nothing against trains. I do enjoy <laughs> them. It's absolutely a more comfortable way to travel, but it's, it, there's not this like diehard passion for it. But what I do think makes me stand out in the train world, I discovered that there's this huge audience of train fans or rail fans, and there's this unique niche audience of real diehard train people that love the little details of a train and facts and there are all those train ch channels out there that there's no talking but they show you everything about the train that's just 
too much for the average person to care about. And I think I'm able to bridge that gap of showcasing the beauties of a train or the experience of a train, the nostalgia, the romance and adventure of riding on a train, but to a more average demographic or person who has interest in travel or mm -hmm. just, I don't know, I'm able to connect those two audiences and gives yeah. me access to a, a big audience rather than really niching on just the train people, I, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Train the the train travel industry is very niche, but it is mm. very diehard. Like my my grandparents are, my grandfather's, I think he's more on like the the he loves the train itself, but he goes on it for some of the other aspects that you've talked about. It's like the social aspect. Like you got to sign up for lunch. You get to meet people. You love all these kind of things. It's much different than the I want to get from here to here as fast as I can. That's why I take a plane. And I sit on it. I close my eyes. I don't want to talk to anyone else. Yeah. There's a social atmosphere to the train. And I think I think you do a good, good part about that, showing the culture behind it. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the other beauties of the train is where it stops. It stops in all these small towns, and that airplanes generally don't. And a great example is my so recent true. trip to Churchill, Manitoba, up to yep. go see the polar bears, which was driven by the fact that I was looking at what train routes I'd be able to do, because those videos tend to do well. Well, the train goes to Churchill. I would not have picked to fly to Churchill. It's it's actually very, it costs $2,000 one way per person to fly from Winnipeg to Churchill, which is a three hour flight or two hour flight. <laughs> but you go by train, it's $600. It's significantly less. Yeah. But that trip was driven by the fact that the train goes there. And then I was able to make a three part series. Part That's one cool. is the train, part two is the polar bears and part three was what's it like to actually live in this Northern town. So I do want to take you beyond the train. I hope that the train brings the audience in to click and watch that video because they're interested, but I hope they stay to see where that train takes you and other adventures that can come from that. Again, I don't want to make it just about the train. There's a lot more to offer. And if I can engage someone and get them interested to stick around and watch that, that's a video that they wouldn't have normally looked up, then I think I've done my job. All three parts are great, by the way, for for oh, our good. listeners highly recommended that that was a very cool series i enjoyed every thank, minute of those three videos they're super cool thank you yeah, very much cool wild up there. Yeah, I, yeah i fell in love with trains actually like traveling on when i took my first ever train ride in canada called the rocky mountaineer and oh you've done that oh dude you gotta do it it's it's, it's amazing from bam it didn't, Vancouver, it didn't run uh, this year oh, because of covid it didn't run so i good. trust me i want to be on it as soon as it starts running again but, uh, <laughs> and you stop in kamloops and yeah. oh, if you go, if you go with uh, friends or, or your your family, um, my family, I went with my family, and we actually stopped in Kamloops. And when we were there, we did an escape room. And like you get to like see these cool. little cultures, and like it, it's a great way to travel. Really, really enjoy if you it. Had flown, you would have missed all of that. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And, and the beauty of the Rockies that you would have flown over instead of rolling through it and enjoying it while eating lunch. And you're forced, <laughs> and you're for not forced, but you get the opportunity to. You, you, we went to Calgary for a day. Then we went to Banff for two days. Then we drove on the train for, I think it's two days. And then we stayed in Vancouver for two days. So now you take what would be a, I don't know, four hour flight and you make it a week long vacation. And it's really centered around traveling in this space together. I highly suggest it. One um, thing the train is really good for is showcasing the journey, not just the destination. Yeah, so many of us yes. are fixated on the yes. destination and you miss out on that middle piece, that journey that everything is in between. So anyway, the train Absolutely. is great for that. Yeah, I love it. And I'm, I'm excited for the video that you produce on the Rocky Mountaineer. Oh, good. Uh, great. Um, so we have one, one question that I wanted to bring up because I think that a lot of the questions that we got were already highlighted in two videos that you've already put out. So I'm going to say... If you go and watch the Q&A that he just released and then uh, the About Him video, you'll get to know a lot of the questions that you asked. But one question, which is interesting, which is from, I'm sorry for butchering this name if I do, and it's uh, Caitlin Rose Peterson. That's actually very easy. You got it. Um, you got that, Mike. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, they asked, what's your favorite place in Vancouver? So I'm going to guess they're local. You put out a couple of videos on what to do in Vancouver. But what, where, where do you spend your time? What's your favorite place there? Oh, man, that's a really tough question because with the way the travel ban has been and us being told not to socialize with people outside of our household, mm -hmm. I have spent a lot of time at home. 
So now I'm trying to think back, back to back to 2019 <laughs> when I actually spent time out and about in the city. Where did I enjoy? Um, I used to really enjoy riding my bike out in the endowment lands. We have a lot of great like wildlife parks and stuff to either mountain bike, walk in the trails. We have a wonderful seawall, which is the North America's longest un or like North America's longest continuous seawall, like sidewalk on the edge of water, essentially. Um, yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, there's a lot of great places. I, I showcase most of them on my channel. And I think I have like five different Vancouver based videos that are just showcasing different spots. It's really hard to pick one. Yeah. And you talk about the seawall. And I think one of the coolest things that intrigued me about the seawall was you talk about the ferry system and the boats yeah. and you can yeah. walk the seawall from one side of Vancouver to the other, and then you can take the boat back. So you get a really yeah. cool perspective on the full circle. Yeah, um, it's a really unique city. Yeah. Very, very, very much so. So that was all of my questions. Uh, Drew, I think that you were closing it out really, really well. So let's let's keep that pass. Sorry to cut you off there. Yeah, I mean, I'll pass it to you, Mike. You know, we left it off saying that you are the man who doesn't know where he's going next. So I'm I'm still kind of curious to ask what you see your channel doing in the future. So that line, I don't know where I'm going next, but I know I want you there with me. That came up 100% naturally on camera. It was not a gimmick or something I created for my marketing mind to work. It was something that came out and I, I literally paused on camera and went, I, I really like that. It was, uh, I think I edited that part out, but someone, <laughs> you know, the, the audience really connects with that. And it was genuine because my channel is so varied, so wide. I don't know if I'm going to be traveling or doing a behind the scenes or a what it might be. And it probably goes to show some of my poor planning when I don't know that far ahead where I'll be going next. So I probably should work on that a little bit. But right now with the way things have been, I am, the next video is planning a tropical vacation in your own city. So showing how we can get out of these winter blues and uh, put on your Hawaiian shirt and go do something resembling a tropical vacation <laughs> wherever you are in the world. So I've got that coming out, just trying to, to do that for myself really, because I think we all need it at the moment. Yeah. Um, but a number of people have commented that they, they love that line and they end their comments with it. They go, we don't know where you're going next, Mike, but we know we want to be there with you. One person said he hopes to use that in his wedding vows one day to wow. his, his partner, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, yeah, that's, right that's on. powerful. Um, so it's just something I, I've stuck with. Sometimes I break it up with a little interruption and in, in explainer in between, but that is... That's about all I can tell you. I don't know where I'm going next. Sorry, after the tropical vacation. So you'll just have to stay tuned. Yeah. Hit that notification bell and you'll be sure to find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely do that. And uh, I mean, you, you got you got two subscribers right here and, and I will continue sure. to watch and continue to wait for this uh, Rocky Mountaineer video to show up on my feed. But I, I appreciate the time. We didn't even get to talk to talk to you about one of the coolest stories i think is your career through college and i think we can leave that to maybe later on we can link up um because truth never been to canada so we can go do something cool in canada yes. um and meet up and talk more about the the transition from 175 to maybe 300 000 subscribers so i don't think that's far away i still feel like i said i feel like i'm at 8,000 still and i'm loving it so uh I, when you say 177 and i'm holding this hundred thousand plaque it still yeah still amazes me but I'm still smiling. I'm still surviving. And we just keep figuring out how to make it work through 2020. Now we're through that. And I hope to see you guys up here in Canada sometime. I'll, I'll be your tour guide. Absolutely. To show you around some of the best spots. Yeah, I'd love yeah, that. Let's do it. I'd love it. that. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the time. So everyone uh, follow his channel. We'll put it in the link in the bio as well as we'll, I, it'll be an I card in the beginning of the video, obviously um, follow that. And uh, all of his social medias will be down below. Make sure you follow him on Instagram or on Twitter or anything like that. All of it is Downy Live. All right. Follow all at Downy Live. We'll have it all in the description below or in the show notes. Um, I appreciate the time so much. This was an amazing conversation and I, I'm Pleasure. super stoked. Thanks, Remember, Mike. guys, break all the rules. Don't listen to your teachers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Rock on. laughs> See ya. Thanks very See ya. much. Thank you.